what we'll be doing right now for next 15 to 20 minutes is we'll do a quick recap of whatever we learned so far just a basic architecture and I have a couple of questions coming up if someone is interested in doing NetEase certification here is a link so I'm pinging you the link okay. in a chat window this is the same certification for both DBA and developer okay so okay. this is a certification on 7.1 so it's the latest one that's that's out there all right so whenever you get a chance go through that so if someone signed up for uh, both DBA and developer classes if someone signed up for both DBA and developer classes what are the topics listed in here will be covered Let's look at the first question okay here now I'll have like 78 questions and I just quickly recap the architecture one more time now this is a this must be a very easy question so you, you can type in a chat window or, or you can use audio by unmuting it right what is Netiza here the these are yeah it's all of the above it's the easiest answer NetEase is a data warehouse appliance. In fact, NetEase is the guy who introduced the term appliance in a data warehouse. It's a black box solution. Why we call it as a black box solution? Right? You don't have to literally know what happens inside. Like the way we use washing machine, right? I don't literally have to know the function of washing machine. I mean, the internals of washing machine to use it, right? So these are ready to production deploy kind of appliances. Of course, it's a simple appliance for serious analytics. Now Netiza is placed in a market for both data warehousing plus analytics. It's all of the above. Now, let's try to answer this question number two. S blade is also called as SPU or SPA or chassis or storage rail. Yes, it's a SPU. Now let me quickly recap the architecture one more time. Whatever the architecture we looked at the other day was for TwinFin. Now this is how NetEase evolved over the years. They have Mustang environment which is no longer under support. I don't think anyone is using Mustang because of its uh, old product. This is a very old product. Back in like 6, 7, it was almost like ending. Then they came up with TwinFin. Then they came up with the Striper. The current one is Mac. These are the brand. These are the brand. So, these are the brands as per the, you know, branding point, from branding point of view, right? You know. The architecture we looked at the other day was for TwinFin. Now we did not speak about at, at this point about uh, you know so far about Striper or Maco. I'll talk about them. But the first thing to understand here is understanding the architecture of TwinFin. Right. <clears throat> so this Mustang is called as 4.x version. This is 6.0, 7.0. These are the software versions. Striper is 7.1, Mac OS is 7.2. Software version. When I say ng state here, it says my state is online. Right? When I log into an interface called ng SQL, Oracle has a SQL plus, DB2 has a DB2. Right? When I say select 
большим. So it says that my current version is 7.2.1.0. So 7.2 is a macro. That's the one we have right now emulator. However, the other day we looked at the architecture of Twinfin. Twinfin architecture is important to understand because on top of it, both the Cypher and Mac were built. Now, from hardware point of view, these are called as 10,000 series. This is a 1000 series. This is a 2000 series. This is a 3000 series. Right? This is a from hardware. Hardware point of view. This is from branding. Right. So if I talk one more time quickly about the twin fin architecture, right? Whether it's a twin fin or a striper or a Maco, the number of hardware components might differ, but the terminology stays as it is. Right? What what is the one we looked at on the top? We looked at that we have a storage, right? In middle I have ports. At the bottom I have blade servers right. what do I have under the storage I have eight disk enclosures DE right. one D disk enclosure is nothing but 12 disks one disk is nothing but one terabyte so total I have eight multiplied by 12 is nothing but 96 disks nothing but 96 terabyte right what I have under host primary standby but these are all red hat Linux host customized for netizen needs what I have at the bottom at the bottom I have two chassis chassis 1 and chassis 2 Each chassis, one chassis has capacity to hold six blade servers. Now one blade server has eight CPUs, eight FPGAs plus 16 GB RAM. Like this, how many blades I have? I have 12 blade servers, which is multiplied by 12 into 8 is 96 CPUs. When I multiply 12 by this 8, which is 96 FPGA plus 192 GB RAM. So in summary, what I am looking at here is 96 disks, 96 CPUs, 96 FPGAs, 192 GB RAM. All these are individual components. All these are individual components. So that means at a runtime what happens is the moment I submit a query, the query is divided into 96 equal parts. Now each part is called as a snippet snippet is nothing but smallest part of a query it's in fact it's not the query that's get divided into 96 equal parts it's a data at the storage time is is capable to divide into 96 equal parts that is something we will understand in a distribution class for now imagine that your data gets distributed I mean your query gets divided into 96 equal parts now each small part is called as a snippet since blade servers 
handles these snippets we call this call these blade servers as s blade servers the older name for s blade servers is spu that is snippet processing unit we call as spus in mustang environment but the same terminology came forward to twinfin striper and maco right now what i'm saying here is the moment i submit a query we have a capacity to divide the query into 96 snippets now each snippet can be given to a combination of one disk plus one fpga plus one cpu plus 2 GB RAM. What is this combination? This combination in Hadoop terminology is nothing but a node. Like this in my system I have up to 96 nodes. Second disk plus second FPGA plus second CPU plus another 2 GB RAM has a capacity to become another node. Like this, I have a capacity to dynamically form 96 different nodes. It's, it's like you are a project manager, okay? And you have a task to complete. And you have 96 resources with you. What would you do? Of course, you divide the task as much as possible, as granular as possible, and give it to each of the resources. That's the ideal scenario, right? What if I give all the tasks to one resource only and keep remaining 95 resources ideal? my task ETA will increase. Ideally, a post project manager makes sure that the work is equally divided and makes sure the turnaround time is less. That's exactly what Niteza does here. So in short, what I'm talking about is for every disk, you have one FPGA, one CPU and two GB. In short, people call this as a one is to one is to one ratio. Right? So this is all we spoke in the architecture class, right? What I'm going to cover in addition to the architecture class is <coughs> this whole configuration, if I open the PPT one more time, architecture PPT. This is, this is where we have a storage. This is where we have our Netiza host. This is where we have our processing power called Blade Servers. When I have all the components in this, you know, look how beautiful it is. There is no empty space at all, right? So this whole component together is called as one rack. The hardware technology for this is one rack. That means my one rack is capable to hold these many storage devices, these many hosts, and these many blade servers. Right. So now, for better understanding, the probably the easiest for the easiest way of doing a capacity planning, what they have did is they have introduced two more terminologies, such as on the top I have eight disk enclosures, right? So four disk enclosures is called as storage array one. Another four disk enclosures is called as storage array two. So what we are talking about here is if I scroll up a little, these eight disk enclosures are divided into storage array one plus storage array two. See what I'm saying? Yeah. <coughs> now storage array 1 plus chassis 1 is nothing but snippet processing array 1 similarly storage array 2 plus chassis 2 is nothing but my snippet processing array 2 What we are saying here is, <coughs> this chassis 1 
plus four store four disk enclosures here are called as spa one. The remaining chassis here plus another four disk enclosures are called as spa two. That means when I say I brought one rack, it is nothing but spa one plus spa two. This is another equation. Let me repeat this one more time. What I am saying here is, I have a full rack. Full rack is combination of SPA1 plus SPA2. What is SPA? Snippet processing array. Snippet processing array is a combination of storage plus chassis. Now four disk enclosures are called as storage array 1. It takes some time to understand the terminology, okay? But you know, it's, is it really important to understand this terminology? Yes, as a database administrator. For a developer, you can just listen it once and ignore it. But for a database administrator, you need to know the terminology. Why? When I connect to this, it is are here. Why? One of the key responsibility of infrastructure DBA is to manage the hardware, right? So how can I see list of hardware available in my system? The moment you log in, when you type a command called nzhw, in a older version, <clears throat> in a older version, we used to have something called inventory, but that's been renamed to ng hardware. Now this is an emulator, but in a real box, you see the output of this hw command in a multiple pages. What are we looking at here? Rack. That means I have one rack only. Rack hardware ID is 1001. Each hardware component has a hardware ID. Unique hardware ID. It's a rack one. Truly is active. Current state is okay. Now under this rack, I see only SPA one. So what I'm talking about here, under this rack, we, whatever I'm talking about here is a real environment. This is an emulator. They cannot give you real environment for practical purpose, right? It's a good that NetEase is giving this emulator. When you go to Oracle Exadata, the competitor for NetEase, they don't give any such emulator for practice, right? But it's good that at least IBM is doing this for free. So when I say one rack here, I have SPA, one. So under this SPA, I have a spoo. Spoo is nothing but blade server. How many blade servers we have under SPA 1? I have six blade servers because I have one chassis. But since again, they cannot give you all the six blade servers. So what they are doing here is they are just giving you one blade server on SPU. And they are giving you three disks. They cannot again give you all the 96 disks for the practical purpose for emulator practice. So they are just giving only two disks. So this is the only difference between real environment and emulator. And, and one more thing called high availability. Rest all the look and feel is exactly similar as a real environment. So if I type a command here, this exact same command bit to bit works in real environment. Too. The only two things that it cannot do here is, one is this hardware is not so huge. So you cannot do the performance testing on the emulator. Second, <coughs> and high availability. We'll talk about that in, a, in either today or tomorrow session. High availability is not available here. So coming back, the new terminology I have introduced in this session is one rack is nothing but SPA1 plus SPA2. What is SPA? SPA is nothing but combination of four disk enclosures. Plus chassis one. SPA 2 is nothing but combination of another four disk enclosures plus chassis 2. That's exactly the same thing I have been asking here. Go ahead Srini. 
Uh, one question actually. So in the, when we saw the LG HW hardware, uh, so it says like three disks, but uh, disks are disabled state, right? Is it expected or I mean it should be active? No, this is okay. The security is disabled. Oh, okay. Security is okay. Right. Yeah. So what has been happened is you know <clears throat> it is a provides disk level security from 7.2. Okay. Right. Encryption, it is a provides. So what happens if someone pulls out all my disks? Right. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Someone enters into my data center and takes all my disks, can they decode? So looking at the security, they have introduced something at a we have encryption decryption mechanisms. But disk level encryption is something that is added in 7.2. So it this, okay. this talks about it. But again, <clears throat> So here is an important thing. How it differs, how emulator differs from uh, real environment is, is capacity or performance of course. Second one is high availability. It cannot provide you this encryption decryption mechanisms that is security. The fourth one is uh, <coughs> storage level zone maps because our storage what we are getting is not a storage that we entitled to get when we buy the box so it's a basic storage right. but but these are the advanced features but, but the real work doesn't affect because of this right. did I answer your query Srini? yeah yes, sir. thank you Yes, Srinivasa. Okay. Ravi, I don't have any questions. Sir. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you. Now let's go back and quickly look at the questions one more time. Now S blade is also called as SPU. SPA, chassis as a storage array. The answer is pool. SPU snippet processing unit was the name came from older environments called Mustang and Mustang environment. Which component is considered as secret sauce for NetEase's performance? SPGE. Yeah, we did not spoke on this yet but I'll be covering immediately after these questions. The answer is FPGA. FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. I'll talk about how NITESA differs from other systems in like five minutes from now. Field Programmable Gate Array. So let's quickly finish up this question number four. And we'll move on to that section. <clears throat> this just talks about the various hardware terminology we heard so far. If I start with the first one, NPS. NPS stands for it is a performance server. SPU stands for snippet processing unit. SPA stands for Snippet Processing Array. S Blade, S in the blades stands for, S in the S Blade stands for Snippet, Snippet Blades. NICs are the Network Interface Cards. FPGA is of course Field Programmable Gate Array. AMPP is nothing but Asymmetric Massive Parallel Processing. All my <coughs> NITESA appliances are AMPP models. It's not just NITESA. Nowadays, all the appliances are EMPP appliances. Okay. They can process the data in a massive way. SMP, Symmetric Multiprocessing Hosts. My hosts are called SMP hosts. Right? They can do multiple things at the same time simultaneously. Right? Whatever you write on host 1 will be written on host 2 as well. CPU, Central Processing Unit of course.
Now let's look at the FPGA's role in the complete performance of Netezer system. Okay. So to understand this, I need to press this point one more time. Okay. Whenever a query comes, query is divided into various smallest units. Right? Now each unit is given to a combination of a disk, FPGA and CPU and memory. Right. So what happens is all these nodes have a capacity to work independently. Work independently. That means this node works independently. This node will work independently of a node 1. Like this all 96 have a capacity to work independently. So when this node is working Right? It streams the data from disk. It reads the data from disk and it puts the it puts the data that comes in the memory. Right? On this memory, FPGA works. So the actual flow is the data comes from disk. Let's say if I am doing some select statement. Select customer ID from customer table where customer ID less than 100. Right? So the data comes from disk, it's normal flow. Data comes to the memory. Right? Just give me one quick second, please. So the date, the moment data is read from a disk, it has to come to main memory, right? On the main memory, our CPU works, right? And filters unnecessary data, processes whatever we want, and brings the result to user. Now, before actually CPU comes into play, we have another intermediate component here in Netiza called FPGA. Now what this guy does here is, this guy reduces the load on CPU. Right? Now how, let's look at this example. Let's say someone is running this query. Someone is doing the select statement. Uh, from table where certain conditions right and ideally I should be having the group by class because I have an aggregate here yeah let's let's for example sake let's look at this I am projecting few columns and I'm restricting on few columns and I'm selecting from a table so when I store the data in this monthly production data I have 96 disks Right. My primary job as a database administrator for a performance, right, for a performance is to make sure this table data gets distributed across all the disks equally. Remember that word, equal. Even if you don't understand now, don't worry. I will have a separate class on it in a distributions section. So in summary, what I'm saying here is when I try to store some data in a table, my job is to make sure the data gets distributed across all the disks equally. This is as equivalent as the same project manager example. You are a project manager, you have 96 resources and you are getting a work, you need to make sure you divide the work. That's exactly the same thing. Someone is loading a 96 million records, let's say, and you have to distribute 1 million in each disk. Now when someone runs the query, this is only 1 by 96 part of a disk, right? So the data comes from the disk. This is compressed by default. Please note that you don't have to apply any external compression mechanisms. Right? Like in other databases, you don't have to worry about whether to go for OLTP or a OLAP or a compress I, compress low, compression, column name.
the data is compressed by default one less headache for a DBA right the moment you take the data out of it in a memory the data will be uncompressed it is uncompressed it's not compressed it's uncompressed here so that's why even though I have this much of a small set when I uncompress it this becomes this huge right now the moment the data is uncompressed who does the uncompression FPGA does the uncompression we are not reaching a CPU layer yet before CPU comes into play we FPGA does the uncompression right now on the uncompressed data it applies projections in the sense if you look at I am only looking at three column selection here see I am looking at only three columns so let's look at the uh, my table might have like 200 different columns right my table might have 200 different columns but how many columns I'm actually looking at in my select query here one two three four five and six <clears throat> so when I need only 200 I mean six columns out of 200 why should I move the remaining 194 columns to the next level right so what FPGA does is there is a project engine within FPGA which filters unnecessary columns moving to the next level. Now what happens after this is it applies a restriction saying that okay this is very good let's say 1000 blocks satisfied here so this much is a size reduced on each block let me apply restrictions saying that whichever is a block satisfying these three conditions that data set only will go to CPU. Now what you are literally doing here is FPGA is reducing load on CPU. FPGA is reducing load on CPU by taking the CPU job in filtering unnecessary data in restricting <coughs> various unnecessary columns like that. You see what I'm saying? So it's exactly doing the CPU job in a traditional data warehouse systems. Right. You can ask me that if FPGA is doing all the job of CPU, what is CPU for? Right? That's a good question. If FPGA takes care of all the CPU work, right, then what is the use of a CPU here? FPGA is like my gate watchman. Right, we are we appoint a security guard. Right, let's say I'm let's say you are throwing a party over a weekend, and you invited various people. Let's say you invited close to 200 families. So you give some instructions to the watchman saying that people who are coming up should come with an invitation. Okay. Right, and they should come in four wheeler. They should come as a family. Right and what kind of a dress style they are using right you can give various restrictions to your watchman saying that anyone satisfying all these then only allow them into the next next phase that is allow them up, upstairs <coughs> right so once they they are in right you you might put multiple conditions like if this person comes in make sure you don't allow that person if that person comes in make sure this person also joins in that kind of a complicated relations uh, kind of yes universe kind of yes yes <coughs> storage level right so now what CPU does here is uh, it, it, it takes care of joins and aggregations if FPGA takes care of all of this CPU takes care of joins and aggregations such kind of a stuff on this reduced result set. I mean as simple as FPGA is helping you to take out the data unnecessary data from the picture. Now is it the same thing seen what the blue bloom filter does? Yeah, yes Ravi. Basically uh, once it gets the query and uh, before it pulls the data from the I mean storage, basically it, 
it only it, it applies some predicates and only the required data it pulls in and then uh, basically it, it performs all the projections and gets the data out of it. Or it's a similar as storage indexes, right? That's what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, okay. Similar kind of, yes. But here, you yeah, have, you, you know, storage indexes are probably these bloom filters you are talking about at a storage layer. Yeah, correct. But this happens after you bring the data out of storage layer. That you can ask me, you know, having the things at a storage layer is much faster than having outside. Yeah, so at, that's why we have at a storage layer something called zone maps, the bloom, bloom filters you are talking about. Uh -huh. This is one more level. We are not there yet. Okay. Yeah, kind of similar interface, yes. Right. Now the question here is FPGA guy reduces the load on CPU by reducing the amount of data it has to process. So if there is no way to filter it, a CPU has to filter it. CPU has to apply join on all these results set against the similar result set. Right? You see what I'm saying? Right. That's the thing. Now, okay, before we move on, any questions so far? So, um, uh, if the zone, zone maps that is at the storage layer filters out like whatever it is not required, um, so after uncompressing, uh, what does actually FPGA does? I mean, when we say store uh, zone map, it's kind of like storage layer indexes or bloom filters. Even those also like will be only pulling the required data, right? Or kind of. So then, what FPGA role? Like? Right. That's a good question. Very good question. So what happens here is even after you apply bloom filters and all that still you get the data in the form of blocks or pages right yeah so let's say you applied these bloom filters and your your table satisfied one block but unfortunately only one record is matching in that block but still you bring the block because you cannot transfer one record from here to here. You have to transfer minimum I.O. that is block size. Let me let me put an example here what I am talking about. Let's say my customer table has block or a page. Or he calls it as a block and we call it as a page. Here we have and this block is storing the data of 100, 101, 200, then page 2 is storing as 202, 203, 204, AC is storing as 301, 110, 120. Okay. Let's say I'm running a query called select start from customer where customer ID is greater than 105 and customer ID less than 120. Now can you tell me how many blocks satisfy this? These are my uh, customer IDs. All the blocks, oh less than 120 right, okay. So this is the only guy. Yeah. Now if I understand those flip filters you are talking about correctly, it has to do only one I.O. Instead of doing two I.O.s, I mean two extra I.O.s, it will it will send this IO here. It still has to, it, it cannot just send this one row because there is no such mechanism. The minimum IO has to be input or output has to be block or a page. Right? So it has to send this entire page 
but even one record satisfying this you still have to send this extra page an entire page with all this data now who does the filtration of on the unnecessary these rows and columns CPU now what we have appointed here is okay zone maps also will help me to send you this page only but before CPU processes these three rows my FPGA takes out this row so this comes out from a disk so what happens from a disk is this comes out now before CPU processes it the FPGA has a capacity to go within a page or a block and take out unnecessary data you see what I'm saying yeah yes sir now this and un this filter data is only passed to CPU now I'm not sure how that's that happens I mean Oracle no, but but nowadays right all the systems provide all kind of features so there is nothing that it just that what best fit for you you know some might work some might not but almost all databases have the same features now but the point here is even though you satisfy only one row you cannot just send that one row there is no such mechanism at this point you have to transfer minimum IO that's a base or a block that's a minimum size that's a challenge right in a OLTP versus OLAP choosing a page size one crucial thing is what is the page size I should use it for OLAP you see what I'm saying yeah that's it so the minimum I hope <coughs> right. did I answer your query yes sir thank you all right so this universal DRU so this is what Purpose of FPGA. Okay. Again, you can. Uh, Ravi, I have, uh, I have one question, Ravi. Go ahead. Some here to database to FPGA, it will be, it will take entire table and it, uh, the FPGA will keep uh, the table into the FPGA, right? After that, it will uncompress it. Right? right. So yeah, yeah, you got it pretty much right. So what mm -hmm. it happens is it it reads block by block. Even though it says that it gets entire data here, yeah, you can imagine mm -hmm. that way at a high level. It puts, it tries to put the data in a memory, but my memory size is only two GB or three GB, right? So mm -hmm. it tries to keep as much as it can, right? And then mm -hmm. FPGA works on that. Mm -hmm. You are right. Does on compression, projection, restriction, the reduced result set will be given to CPU. But please note okay. that FPGA is doing this job. CPU won't be, mm -hmm. CPU will be working with something else, right? Yeah, understood. You made yeah, it granular, right? So, now, there is one more important point to look at here is, this is how the flow goes. Disk, memory, FPGA, CPU, so, each individual one will communicate with host through NIC network interface cards right, at a high level so this architecture AMPP architecture is something that everyone should be familiar with right. now here is the thing even though I say there is no association between disks FPGAs and CPUs there is no physical association saying that always this disk get associated with this FPGU even though I say there is no such association but still certain ground rules in having that association so here I am saying that whenever I get a query the query is divided into 96 snippets each snippet is given to a combination of one disk FPGA CPU and 2 GB RAM and this will be selected dynamically it's only partially true right but still there is some association what is that association <coughs> when you start Netiza system when you run a command called ng start Netiza selects the topology the term here is topology it selects the topology in such a way that let's say I have these many S blades right 
let's say I have uh, how many S blades in twin fin? 12 S blades, right? 12 S blades. How many discs I have? 96 discs. What it assigns here is first S blade, you get these many 8 discs. Second S blade, you take care of these 8 blades, 8 discs. Like that, it associates a set of 8 discs with each S blade. <clears throat> it associates a set of 8 discs with each S blade. Here I am showing you only 3, 3, 3 here, but ideally a set of 8 discs with S blade, 8 discs with this S blade, 8 discs with this S blade. But still the 1 is to 1 ratio stands still. Because I have 8 discs here, I have 8 FPGAs, 8 FPG, 8, F 8 CPUs and 16 GB RAM. Let's say <clears throat> if your ETL is trying to if your ETL is trying to load the data into this disk. Let's say if your ETL would like to load data into this disk. Right? That insertion into disk has to happen only through this S blade. It's an important point. When you would like to read from this or a write from write into this. The operation should happen only through this S blade. That does not mean these guys cannot talk to it, but they won't talk to it because of the protocol rules. Right? So within this S blade, you have 8 CPUs and 8 FPGAs. It does not talk about which CPU, which FPGA. It only talks about you should talk to this guy. I mean, you should talk to through this guy. But which one? There is no binding. The only binding is that if you want to read from these blocks, it should only come through this S blade. Got my point? But which one out of these 8 CPUs and 8 FPGAs, there is no restriction. <coughs> so this topology is decided by an ETSA system by default whenever you do a command called ng start. ng start is a command which is used to start your NetEaser system. When you say ng state, it shows you which state you are in currently. So ng stop is a command to stop. ng start is a command to start. Okay. In this AMPP architecture, even though I say everyone is loosely coupled with each other and they magically formed as a node set around time, but still there are some restrictions. The restrictions are with association between disks and S blades. But let's in case this S blade fails, we'll talk about that in tomorrow's class, high availability. Let's in case this S blade fails, these disks are assigned to these blade servers. Right. I mean that's something we'll talk about in next class. What happens when these any of these hardware components fail? Right? How NetEasa takes care of high availability. Yeah, before we move on further, any questions to this point? That topology you can see it with a command called NJHW. Right. So this disk one. Is associated with SPA1. This two is associated with SPA. But in the real environment, it might be associated with SPA. You have a query. Now let's also look at what happens when someone submits a query. We don't really have to understand the internals at this point, but at a high level. When a user submits a query, the only way you can talk to a database is through SQL, right? We, we all three from a different geographical locations and we are speaking a common language called English. Similarly, the only language that databases understand or DBMS understands is SQL open source language. Let's say you issued a SQL language command. It first hits compiler. I mean it, it all of course comes through the listener port, 
and it is directed and a thread is assigned and <clears throat> all that stuff is there but within here it first hits the compiler the query is compiled the query is compiled saying that <clears throat> does, does the query is correct syntactically and semantically <clears throat> first the query pass the compiler or if it is the same query let's keep coming it looks for the same query in object cache I think this is something like shared pool right so then the query goes through optimizer the optimizer is heart of our entire database system please note that all these components are at host the host as in here we are let's scroll up a little here we are the moment I submit a query we first hit host what is the major component that we hit in host compiler query is compiled then query is given to optimizer now optimizer divides the query into smaller snippets each snippet is given to a scheduler now scheduler is the guy responsible for scheduling it based upon the priority let's say if we all three are fighting for resources who should get highest priority if we three are fighting for resources with a business user who should get a priority if all four fighting for resources with the CFO who should get highest priority everything is designed within this the logic we see more of them in a workload management concepts how this guy schedules something once this guy decides the priority it pushes those snippets to s blades with the specific instructions saying that you read from a specific disk and filter this unnecessary data and all that information now this s blades follows blindly follows the instructions given by scheduler and reads the data and works accordingly I mean, how it works internally there is no very documented of it's all patented by a netizer right but however at a high level we first hit netizer host <coughs> here the priority gets divided I mean decided and given to s-blades disk enclosures work together right. so that's the same thing I given it here one more frequent query people ask in Netiza is what about capacity planning right so if you look at here what we are talking here is on a twin fin architecture on a twin fin architecture what we are looking at here is 96 disks right I'm saying that 96 terabyte right but entire this 90 to 96 terabyte is not a user data now we are saying that one disk is equals to one terabyte now this one terabyte is divided into three equal parts so only one by three you store user data one by three you store <coughs> some other disks user data this is for mirroring purpose just to safeguard your data one by third is temp data you see what we are doing out of 96 terabyte we are talking about we are only talking about 96 by 3 32 terabyte of user data right that means on a twin fin one rack model you can only store 32 terabyte of user data but please note that this is after the compression this is after the compression so that means you might be literally storing like 200 or 300 terabyte of data Ravi? Um, actually, what is the, I mean, based on the, I don't know, the, uh, no, uh, your work experience, uh, what is the compression ratio that you see? I mean, because in Oracle, based on different compressions, um, we see the uh, compression size of the data would be different. 
So just I'm just wondering like what would be the compression ratio here? Yeah. At least four to six times is guaranteed. Four to okay. Minimum. I mean, it's more depends upon the syllables or uh, the common repeated symbols. Like address gets some more compression rather than the customer mm -hmm. ID column. So it's a column near compression, like our Alexa data does. Okay. At least four to six times is minimum guaranteed. Right. Okay. So now that means when I buy one rack, we're talking about of 32 terabyte of user data. What if I need more than this, right? What if even after compression, like this 32 terabyte, what if I need more than this? What if I need 50 terabyte? Let's say you are an architect. So you understood your client requirement and said that you need 50 terabyte, right? Now, one rack is not going to suffice, right? So what you need to go is one rack. Maybe let's go ahead and buy another rack. So what you have to do is you just have to buy two racks here and put each one of them together and connect them with a you know high speed network between them. This guy these all things NetEase are so NetEase's company will take care of it. So you just need to buy another rack and put next to here. Everything will just get doubled. But you have only host at only one box, one rack, of course. So that means you get 32 terabyte plus 32 terabyte. <clears throat> but, but the point here is this is one scenario. What if you need only 40 terabyte? What if you need only 40 terabyte? <clears throat> right? What if I need only 40 terabyte? If I go ahead and buy this. I'm wasting 24 terabytes of space extra. Can't I have a customized space such as, right, can't I buy these 32 terabyte rack? Can't I add my own 8, eight terabyte storage? Personal, 8 terabyte of personal storage. Can't I add this? The answer is no. But you can do these things in Exadata. Right? You can have your own storage if I'm not wrong. But here you cannot do that. So the best thing you can do is it is is giving us a customizable configuration such as one rack is nothing but spa one plus spa two. So they'll give you the half rack, which is nothing but spa one, which is nothing but four disk enclosures plus six blade servers. So when I talk about four disk enclosures, which is 48 disks, which is 48 terabyte which is nothing but 48 by 3 16 terabyte of user data. They also have a half rack. They have only half rack in twin fin. I mean quarter rack in twin fin. It's been discontinued in the future ages, but just in case, just to let you know. Quarter rack is nothing but 8 terabyte, 16 by 2. So instead of me going ahead and buying uh, one rack here, what I do here is I buy one rack plus quarter rack. So what we are looking at is 32 terabyte plus 8 terabyte, which is 40 terabyte. <clears throat> in summary, in summary, what I'm trying to explain here is capacity planning is very easy. No, I remember many times I shouted at a developer saying that you should have let me know in advance when you are loading like million records, right? Or the weekend. Or the weekend we have a limited support and someone has to let us know in advance when they are loading huge data. You don't have to worry about it. Here. Because this is what you can do. I mean, if you are loading more than 40 terabytes of data, it's not appliance to go for. You should go for half rack or quarter rack. Maximum capacity is fixed. The concept of capacity planning is very simple. These are the specifications. This is what we get. Choose whatever you want. Right? This is like a washing machine, right? 
you get a 6 kg washing machine, you get a 5 and a half kg washing machine, you get a 6 and a half kg washing machine, but you don't get 6.25 kg, right? You want to go ahead and buy. If you want to buy a lower one or upper one, but you cannot get 5.75 kg, you cannot get a 6.25, you cannot get a 6.1. You see what I'm saying? If I fix things like that, many things will get easier. The storage is, look how easy it is. Otherwise, you have to depend upon why ASM came in picture, automatic storage management, just to simplify the work of L1 and L2 resources. And, but still, you have to increase the file systems, and you have to add a space, this and that. Don't have to worry about it. All fixed. You have to take one best call when the project starts saying that what is the capacity you need. You might be at 20 terabyte and growing at 10% every year. So I, you know, for next 6-7 years I have a plan to go to Hadoop. So I have to survive on this data warehouse. So how much is the storage I need? With a solution. You work with IBM support and get the configurations and tell them that, okay, this is what I need. They suggest me. In summary, so you can do the architect role of capacity plan here. Any questions to this point? Uh, um, um, so when we extend, mm -hmm. say for example, if, we, if I go like for an half ad, I only get the uh, you know disks plus. Um, S, uh, SPS, right? Uh, no, no, no. If you extend, if you extend existing system, but if you if you plane by a half rack, you get posts as well. Okay. Uh, my question is, am I gonna get the hosts in, for the half rack, or it will be just uh, the half rack will be utilized with the existing hosts? Yeah. If you go to the IBM support and tell them that. Uh, if you go to IBM support and tell them that I already have one rack, give me half rack, they don't give you host. Okay. Because you already have host. But if I go to the IBM support and tell them that, okay, uh, I am buying a half rack fresh, then you get a host. Okay. So, uh, will that not be a problem like, you know, um, with addition of this half rack? Um, I mean, just curious to know, is that going to impact any of the performance? No, no, no. The host is capable to handle it. Okay. The host is, you know, they have designed it in such a way that, you know, they can add like 10 hosts, 10 racks or 20 racks or as many as you want. So the host is capable to do it. Okay. Because the main host just takes the call saying that uh, host just decides the plan, nothing else, man. So the actual, uh, you know, stuff happens on these blade servers. Okay. So who just decides, right? Compiles and optimizes. Nothing else host does here. So the actual things happens on blade servers and S blades. So the number of the more guys you have here, the better parallelism you get. It's as simple as parallelism, right? So in Oracle, such kind of systems, you have parallelism or optimizer teams. I mean, you, you can't control. See that the one more point here is you cannot dis dictate optimizer here. You cannot dictate okay. optimizer to full table scan. You cannot dictate optimizer to say use this and use that. You have to follow whatever it says. And the degree of parallelism will be constant. I mean, uh, whatever the NetEaser defines. It defines in the sense number of disks you have, that is the parallelism you can get maximum. Okay. Degree of parallelism. So. <clears throat> I mean, number of disks. So it's automatically partitioned, right? When I say I have 96 disks, let's say I have disk 1, disk 2, disk 3, disk 4, let's say I have disk 96. If I'm storing 96 million records, I, I have my, I have 96 partitions here already. It's like a partitions only, right? So I need to make sure 1 million here, 1 million here. Yeah, this is a different huge concept for performance on together. Right? So it's like 96 resources I have, I need to distribute the load. Make sense? Yep, yes.
So I'll stop here for today. Tomorrow what will I'll start with this. I start with it is a high availability and we'll meet an half an hour lately. So that will get uh, some time, complete time. So high availability and then we start with various NGSQL interfaces like SQL plus interface. How do we talk to databases? Then we also look at database objects and creation. Right. So in the meantime, you send me the contents you need to be prioritized.